Welcome everybody. Uh, to uh, I'm Brandon Rhodes, and this is a uh, quick talk on tracing Python with strace or truss. The title is very nearly a lie. I think you'll notice as we go along that it's really more or less about tracing Python with strace. But I swear, truss is almost the same thing. And any of you on a BSD like Mac OS X or something else. Uh, read the man page, and, and there are websites online as well that will show you how to translate the strace command lines that I use to their equivalent truss commands. They both do the same thing, as I'll explain in a moment. Uh, first, I have to explain what is a system call. This is at a very low level. It's the sort of thing you, you'll see if you're writing in C. Hundreds of times a second. Your operating system does something that's really kind of frightening, that's really very dangerous if not handled properly. It turns over control of the CPU to some process that your system is running. Maybe your web browser, maybe an email uh, program, maybe the shell or one of the commands that you're running from the shell. And this is very frightening because once uh, you, you, you set the CPU fetching and running instructions from a third party program, I mean, who knows what it's going to do, what sort of bugs it might have, what sort of mistakes it might make. And so the whole point really of the operating system is that each process is sandboxed. Uh, this is why under non-operating systems like Windows 3.1 or DOS, <laughs> and not me, my OS professor that I'm channeling there, uh, under a non-operating system that's not really able to sandbox different processes, an error, uh, a, a, a data corruption caused by one process can tank your whole system uh, or compromise the security of other running processes or damage kernel memory structures. Uh, but a real operating system uh, places, it run, when it hands over control of the processor for a hundredth of a second or whatever, to your web browser to do its next little bit of work, or an icon in the corner of your screen to do its next little bit of work. It sets it up so that it has its own memory er area that it can read and write from, but where the process has to ask the OS for everything else it might want to do, in particular for every way in which it might want to affect the outside world. Uh, back in very, very early computers, two programs running at once, if they both tried to talk to the printer, you got garbage out of it. With a modern operating system, you have to ask the OS to talk to the printer on your behalf. So several programs can all print at once, and the files are separately put in the print queue. And those uh, requests uh, are called system calls when the process that's running has done as much as it can by playing with memory and building data structures and collating stuff together, and where it finally needs to go ask the operating system to make some effect in the outside world happen. Um, if you're interested in uh, more detail in how that memory sandbox is constructed, uh, my, uh, they recorded and put online my Python linkers and virtual memory talk from PyCon 2012. Uh, this talk is not going to focus on how the sandbox is built, but is going to focus on the tools. It's kind of fun. Because the OS has to be involved, every time your process touches a file, every time your process talks on the network, every time your process does anything really except read and write from its own memory, the OS can give you a trace or log of every single thing your program does that affects the outside world. Uh, two quite equivalent commands, their output format is slightly different, are strace, which does this on Linux and thus on Ubuntu if you're, you're uh, using that for production or de development, and truss, which is the BSD version of the command, uh, and, and thus is what you would run if you have a Mac laptop that you're running your application or process on. Let me just pause for a moment to say that the whole Unix concept of having an output called standard error is really, really awesome. And for the purposes of the examples today, I will not be using it. And I will explain why. So standard error is awesome. Here I have a cat command that returns an error. 
Uh, the cat command, which attempts to read three files and only succeeds on two of them, is then made the input to the word count command, which is here telling us the number of lines, words, and characters in uh, a.html and b.html. The error you will note, printed by cat when it found its third argument wasn't, uh, uh, could open it, appeared on our screen. Rather than causing wc to see one extra line, half a dozen extra words, and, and uh, 60 maybe uh, extra characters, how did we get that error onto our screen for us to see without it getting mixed in with the data that cat was providing to that next command? And the answer is this concept of a standard error stream. Each of these commands, this is what it would look like if I ran uh, that pipeline we saw on the previous page. Each process that starts up in Unix already expects to have three open files available to it. File number zero, it expects to read input from if it's a command that requires input. By default, it's hooked up to the terminal you're typing on. Uh, standard output is by default hooked up to your terminal. Uh, but if you've built a pipeline, the standard output actually sends its data into the next command. And then the whole point here is that that's not all. If that was all, if all we had was an input and an output, then even our error messages would get mixed in with the data that in this case the word count command is trying to consume. The magic is that there is a third default file, given the number two, because we all count from zero, of course. And that, unless you redirect it, is by default hooked up to the TTY so that the error messages cat produces are not interleaved and mixed up with the output, the data that cat produces. Uh, I can make that a little uh, uh, clearer here by explicitly redirecting um, file descriptor number two into a little file called ERR and then uh, put the output of WC into a file called out, which you'll note results in no output. There's nothing between those two dollar signs. I now have the error message captured in one file, the output captured in another, because I've used shell redirection to get the two data streams that were producing output and put them each in a separate place. Standard error is really wonderful, because it lets you build a big pipeline of commands where data is streaming that are never confused by the output of error messages because it goes somewhere else. Uh, so again, uh, zero uh, is standard in, one is standard out, two is standard error. You'll often see the greater than sign without a number to the left of it because one, standard out is the default. If you do a shell redirection without telling it the integer number of the file descriptor you want to redirect. All of that to say, we could, if we wanted, capture the output of strace. The way you invoke strace is simply by getting the command you would run already and putting the word strace to the left of it. Um, we could get that error output and use two greater than to send all of the logging messages into a file so they don't get all mixed up on our screen with the actual output of our process. Um, but if script.py does print error messages, if Python dies with a stack trace or prints a logging message or something like that, it would be mixed into our trace as well. So what I'm going to do during this talk is I'm going to leave standard out and standard error where they would normally go and leave the Python script in charge of uh, producing data there. S trace because it understands you might not want its trace mixed in with your program's error log uh, or error output. It allows you to put a dash O command in order to uh, just write it into a file instead. Before I get into what Python does when you S trace it, or rather what, what it always does, and when you S trace it, you can see it do it, uh, let's trace a far simpler command. There is a command on your system, which is extremely, extremely simple, called bin true. It has one purpose, 
besides, in modern versions, telling you its version when you say dash V. <laughs> its real purpose is simply to exit with status zero. Every process in a Unix system or a POSIX system, when it exits, returns an integer, how did I do? Am I happy or unhappy with how I exited uh, status code? Bin true's job is to exit with status zero. Um, you might wonder why zero for success? Because uh, the reason is that success is typically boring. One code for success was considered fine. On the other hand, there's lots of ways that a program might exit with an er error or a problem, so they wanted to leave all of the non-zero integers free so that if a process died horrifically and fatally, it could uh, perhaps, if you read its man page, uh, explain why it had died and what had caused it. Um, if you're ever running in the shell and are curious, I wonder whether the last command I ran was happy or sad about how it exited. Uh, there's a special, uh, in, in, in bash or other shells, there's a dollar sign question mark variable you can use, which will show you whether, in this case, the previous grep command was happy. You might not have known this. If you run grep for a pattern against a file that doesn't contain that pattern, it returns an error code. Why would grep return an error code if it success successfully, so to speak, found that zero lines happened to match? The reason is grep wants uh, to support its use in the shell's if statement, which is simply a test of the return value. So here, uh, you can see that because grep returns that uh, zero or one uh, success or error status code, you can see that the if statement built into bash or whatever shell you use can choose whether to take the then or the else clause based on whether grep found something. Grep considers zero matching lines to formally be an error. Not such a big error that it prints an error message. That would be messy and not like Unix. But a big enough error that its return code, if you check it, is one rather than zero. Um, so error statuses, uh, if you ever uh, are into, start writing a lot of shell scripts, uh, note that the only place in a shell script where it's OK for your command to return a non-zero, I hit an error status, is in an if condition or a while condition. The shell's not going to exit with an error because an if condition command came out with an error. The whole point of an if is that you are prepared for the command that's the condition, to succeed or fail. But if any of the other commands outside of the condition clause fail in your shell script, the whole shell script shuts down and exits right there. You'll some, there are a number of different conventions that people use to write shell scripts that can survive the failure of a particular command. One is to put or true at the end of the command uh, so that if the command fails, the true command is run so that it can return its zero error code. You can also, up before uh, the commands that might fail, simply set the shell to dash uh, options to dash E so that it survives errors. That's what you do if you have a bunch of commands, some of which might fail, but the rest of which you want to run even in the case of failure. So, bin true. Its job is to return exit status zero. In the first versions of Unix, it was simply an empty file. Because it was 1972, and that saved bytes. <laughs> or, or maybe even 1970. Um, seeing a file that didn't have a binary header at the front, marking it as a binary executable, uh, your shell, bash, or back then sh, would assume that the program was a shell script. It would run this zero length shell script. The shell would ex execute no commands, not encounter a failure doing so, and return success. I ran all the commands in that file and return exit status zero. So it was, at least on disk, a very efficient way to have a little bitty zero length, in fact, program that uh, if you put it into an if statement or something like that, would always come out as a success. Now, AT&T, uh, in the early 80s, decided to commercialize Unix and tried uh, selling it. And it was really rather a failure. 
sort of like Xerox Park and the idea of the mouse and the windowing system. Uh, they, they, they didn't do it successfully. But uh, a guy named John Chambers uh, wrote a wonderful uh, series of posts because he noticed something. This is how Ben True looked in System 5 once it was commercialized and delivered. It's a copyright message. That's not copywriting anything. Uh, I assume that AT&T just wrote probably a shell script to run through all of the uh, shell scripts in the bin directory and just stick a header like this at the top of all of them. But it resulted in an executable that is nothing but a copyright comment. John Chambers was very interested in that, this and asked the question, has AT&T... <laughs> there's, there's only two interpretations here. Either AT&T had copyrighted their own copyright message, or if legally you don't consider the copyright message to be part of the work, are we violating AT&T copyright every time we create an empty file? Logically, those were the two options. They either had copyrighted their own copyright message or simply copyrighted the empty file so that none of us could use it. And AT&T has never deigned to answer that question. <laughs> but I believe that the old, the, the, the corporate versions of, of Unix still carry that uh, comment in the empty slash bin slash true. On my Linux laptop, I, I suppose they didn't want any copyright wars with AT&T, they re-implemented bin true as an actual executable. If you ask the file command about it, it sees that that binary header is there. And so, Given that it's a real, these days, honest to goodness binary, you can strace it. And so here's the simplest possible strace command, where you say, put the output in trace.txt, O is for output, and let's run the simplest possible program. And we'll, uh, I'll go through this in a moment with a bigger font, but, but this is it. Uh, maybe two dozen system calls uh, are made during the run of bin true, and then it has exited with exit code zero, and succeeded. So this uh, is sort of the minimum you'll see, not, not from a Python script, but from an even simpler program. You're always going to see a few dozen, a couple of dozen system calls, simply because that's how many are necessary for the C runtime to start up and run a program like uh, the default version of Python from the website, CPython, that's written in C. Uh, let's look briefly at these lines, because you'll see them a lot. When we look at system calls, zero usually means success. Neg negative one is usually what they return as they uh, if they return an integer to mean I failed. There's been a failure, and if they do fail, uh, the C runtime gets the error code they return and stores it in its C, a global. It might be a thread local global. I haven't checked, but still bad practice nonetheless. Um, and the, uh, if you're wondering what the different errors are that a system call can uh, re return, you can ask the man command to look up in section two the particular system call that you've seen listed in the output of strace or truss. So here, for instance, is a, uh, the first line in that trace we just saw is a success. It's the process asking the system to load up and run the bin true command. It, uh, uh, the, it runs the break command. The, the break is the, the highest um, address that your, uh, I believe, heap can have. So this is typically run when you need to allocate a few more data structures and need a little more memory. The uh, C runtime, before doing any dynamic library loading, checks one or two files. And on my system, I haven't customized the loader's behavior. So it gets negative one, meaning an error. And this and error now is sent set to error, capital E, no entry. I don't see anything called no hardware capabilities. I don't see a file called preload, where you can list libraries you want to be loaded unilaterally before every process you run starts up. Um, and then it asks another, the other way to ask for a little more memory when you need it 
is to ask for a memory map of uh, in the negative one tells the system, oh, I'm not asking you to map a file from the file system into my memory. I just want a new memory, uh, region of memory. Give me 8k to play with, please. And if it succeeds, it returns the address at which that new block of memory it's allocated for you is uh, stored. Uh, the next thing that bin true does, or the C runtime beneath it, I should say, um, is it needs to look at ld.so.cache, which is a place where, uh, because it would be very expensive every time you needed to load a shared library to go searching for it, uh, ld.so.cache is a pre-made list of all the shared libraries on the system. And this is a maneuver you'll see again. It opens it. Remember I said that file descriptors 0, 1, and 2 are already occupied when a process starts by its standard input, output, and error? So the first file a process opens then gets file descriptor number 3. It stats it to see how big it is and gets that it's about 95k. And so it asks, instead of uh, doing a series of reads to copy all that data into memory, it does something here called a memory map where it asks the operating system to create a region of memory that when the process tries, tries to read from it, actually just returns blocks from the file. That's necessary if you want the processor to execute the contents of a file, because the processor just issues reads as it runs through the code that you're trying to run. And it's also just a very efficient way to be able to randomly access the blocks of a file without having to uh, read and read and read it into memory or seek back and forth and then read the blocks that you want. Uh, and in this case, I believe that the ldso.cache is built as, as a sort of a hash table that you really would like to get to in random access order, because unless you rely on a lot of uh, shared libraries, you'll probably only use a fraction of it. Once the memory map is accomplished, we close that file descriptor. And we're back to only 0, 1, and 2 being opened. And so this is the complete life and death, for a moment, of file descriptor number 3, from the open that allocates it to the close that uh, finishes it out and makes that file descriptor number available again. Um, I should mention an old essay called Pearl Meets Cobalt. It's a cool little essay if you're into education or talks or explaining things to people by a Perl programmer that once got the job to go explain Perl to COBOL programmers. This isn't just a difference between the language Perl and the language COBOL. Good luck, guys. But it got into the way that uh, Unix systems think about files that Perl writes on top of versus how old IBM mainframes and VMS mainframes thought of files, which is what COBOL writes on top of. He, uh, the author of that essay says, and this was a surprise to him, because he was surprised how like he would, they would be ignorant of something, and he'd be like, oh, I have to explain this in detail. It would turn out he already knew. They already knew what he was talking about. They just didn't use the same word. So he says, I didn't have to explain file handles. They already knew about file handles. That's what Perl calls file descriptors. But they used jargon to talk about them, that wasn't the jargon I was familiar with. Oh, you're establishing addressability on the file, someone said. They seemed pleased at how easy it was to establish addressability on a file. <laughs> uh, because in older languages, it might require a dozen steps in allocating a bunch of data structures to earn the right to read or write from a file. On Unix, you just pass the path you get back an integer that gives you that right with all of the data structures hidden over on the operating side of the fence. It might seem normal now, but it was a big innovation in 1969 and 70. If you're ever curious what files a uh, process has open, there's an ls open file command that will list them all for you and let you see how many uh, resources, how many files and sockets a process has open. Uh, and so, it is now time for this bin true command, simplest possible command, to load the one library it depends on, which is libc, the standard C library. And this is simply a more complicated version of what we just saw, memory mapping a file rather than just reading it all up front, 
into a region of memory. It opens it, uh, asks, uh, or, or reads the 512 byte ELF header at its beginning, asks how big it is so it knows how many bytes now need to be mapped, and following the instructions in the ELF header gets the different sections of the file mapped into memory where they can simply be accessed by reads and writes. Once they're mapped, you can close the file descriptor and Python will keep the file open as long as these memory maps are there. And bin true is essentially now done. It does one last little request for 4K of memory, sets up a thread local area in case uh, C starts any more threads, uh, uh, fiddles with a few protection bits on those memory areas, <gasps> And finally, the actual source code of bin true gets, not the source code, the compiled in machine instructions get to run, which immediately exits. So <laughs> nothing happens. This whole C runtime gets set up and then is like, oh. <laughs> well, I guess you're not going to use all that then. Uh, does an unmap and as promised, exits with the code zero. So um, all of that is essentially, in most cases, from your point of view, noise. Every time you trace a command and open up the trace, you'll see that same rigmarole over and over as the C runtime gets itself set up. Um, the difference being that as we now turn to look at Python, essentially between these two commands, the last memory setup command and the uh, first teardown command, in between those two lines, you'll suddenly see a lot of interesting things happen as your code, as your .py file is interpreted by the Python runtime to get things done. I noticed that even the strace manual page says, it's a pity that so much tracing clutter is produced by systems employing shared libraries. So even they admit it's a, a well, quite a bit of noise. If we now turn from the po simplest possible bin true command to running Python on a completely empty script, dash C lets you provide Python with the Python program it's supposed to run right in the um, command line, a Python program that does nothing runs 507 different system calls. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through them all. The summary is this. It starts exactly the same as bin true did, as the C runtime starts up and checks its loader settings. You then see not just libc, but seven different shared libraries getting loaded up, opened, memory mapped, and then closed, um, leaving the memory maps in place. And you can see, well, why does it load seven shared libraries? If you ask your shell where Python, in this case 3.4, lives, and run the LDD command on it, it will actually show you the list of all of the shared libraries that that particular binary needs. That's why in the S trace, you'll see all of them getting loaded in order. After some further memory map shenanigans on the part of the Python startup routine, you'll see it load some truly random numbers from dev u random so that any random things Python has to do like encryption are based on at least uh, fairly well seeded pseudo randomness. The Python runtime is it, it, it promises that you can ask with sys.executable what the real path of your Python binary is and so it's going to run through the shell path until it finally finds that binary so it can store its true path checks a few config files, because this is Python 3.4 that has the virtual end capabilities built in. And then it has to find, where is my standard library? I'm a Python 3.4, 2.7 or whatever. Where around here is my standard library stored? What it does is it looks for lib Python 3.4 for something called OS. And if it doesn't find it right next to the Python binary, it starts stepping out to each parent directory looking for os.py. This is how virtualenv works. It creates a little fake lib directory, lib python ver dot version number, and sticks a, a copy of os.py there so that Python will identify the virtual environment 
as its uh, run, uh, runtime area, the path it's supposed to use, uh, instead of the system one. Once all that's set up, Python now begins importing things. There's maybe a dozen or two modules that Python needs internally in order to run. The first thing it tries to do so it can print to the screen is to load the encodings module. This is interesting. It doesn't know ahead of time whether the encodings package is a, um, whether it's, it's done to init, whether the main module of that package is a system-specific compiled shared object, whether it's a DLL that is uh, generic and doesn't have a version number attached, whether it is uh, a binary independent compilation of that shared object, a plain old shared object, or whether it, under and it's going to be implemented by a real Python file or even a compiled PYC. So when you say import blah, Python is going to try to look for all of the different names that a blah module could be named, which uh, by uh, now, 2014, is quite a few different places it could live. And it is going to do that every time you run import for every directory it doesn't find the module in in sys.path. How many file names does Python try during an import? In general, it has to search all of the directories in sys.path and in each directory has to search for every possible extension a module could have. System Python, this is OK, because sys.path is rather modest, a uh, half dozen directories on my system. In a virtual env, there's a few more on top. It searches the virtual environments directories first, so the list is a little longer. Anyone here remember easy install? Easy install adds another path to sys.path for every single thing that you install. ZC recipe egg depends on ZC build out, so you wind up with, in this case, two extra paths. Guess what happens if you install something that's based on ZOAP? You get 183 paths uh, going back one because each egg that you install is its own path inside of sys.path. So, the longer the sys.path is, it generates more system calls for each import. Uh, there's a way that we can, instead of having to grep or, or count or something, we can just ask strace to count how many system calls happen. We can have it even, instead of having a huge list of all of those different system calls, like mmap that we saw, we can direct its attention to just open in stat64, the ones involved in import. Normal Python on my system, sorry. Um, and, and here I'm just a, a tiny little Python program that just imports one thing from the standard library. Normally, for the whole Python uh, environment to start up, open the shared libraries, then open all the Python files that Python depends on, and then to import popen2, takes 378 system calls. Uh, it takes uh, a few ten thousandths of a second on my machine, because modern machines are very fast. If, on the other hand, I'm in a virtual environment where I have a few more things on sys.path, I counted more than 500 system calls just to start up and import popen2. <laughs> if you have installed something that depends on ZOAP in, uh, with easy install, not even importing it, just trying to import something from the standard library and then exit, uses a total of 5,707 system calls, and as you can see by the timings over there, we're inching towards two hundredths of a second just to start the process. Um, you can also run time uh, on a process if you're interested, and in here without, because tracing, strace does slow down your process because it's stopping to log everything it does. So here we can see that it's really only, only a tenth of a second that's added to your startup time uh, by having installed uh, a ZOAP product with easy install. Remember, we're not using it yet. What if we did use it? What if we not only have it installed so our sys.path path is huge, what if we actually wanted to import it? The result, of course, for those of you who are CS nerds, is going to be an order n squared because we're going to be importing all n dependencies. Presumably it imports them. Why else would it depend on them? And uh, for each of them have to search all of those directories.
And so I counted on my system 73,000 system calls just in order to import Grok, the web framework, and then exit. Always, always, always use pip and virtual env. Uh, you'll note that they represent um, easy install and pip are two completely different approaches to how your laptop or machine can have many Python projects installed on it. Easy install's idea was that, well, everything has to be installed in the system site packages. How can you uh, be working with several different projects, one of which might use Django 1.3 and one of which might use Django 1.6? Easy install's idea was that, as you saw, everything we easy install gets its own directory. And then when you're ready to run your app, we build a custom sys.path that only pulls in the particular versions of the particular dependencies that your app needs. Virtual Env and PIP, these more modern tools, have a different idea. Let's create different virtual environments, one for each project you're working on, that each have their own site packages, so that instead of everyone fighting over who owns slash Django and having to hide those, going back one slide, instead of having to hide those slash Django's inside of version-specific directories, this little project installs the one version of Django it needs. There's no contention, and there's no reason to make sys.path any longer than usual. Always use pip. Always use virtual env. Uh, on Python 3.3 and later, you will notice that the uh, toll is not as great, is not as terrible when you try to import a lot of uh, packages, because finally they have added an os.lister command, uh, or call, I should say. When it starts up, it lists each of the directories on sys.path, so that when you, can imp when you say import foo, it can just go look in those cache lists and know immediately what file to jump to to grab foo instead of having to open and stat all of the time. So going back to just my normal system Python, importing a reasonably complicated package like the email package, you can see that Python 3.4 uses less than, I believe, half the number of system calls in order to get it done because it, again, caches the list of modules available and where they are in the sys.path rather than rediscovering that over and over again. Now, just stopping here with this idea of watching and being able to see import happen, these stacks of stat and open calls give great information for you to use. If import example isn't working, look at the trace. Is the directory, uh, grep through it, is the directory that contains example.py even getting searched? You might find that it's not, that you can't find the directory name in any of those open commands or stat commands. And you'll want to go check your sys.path and find out why that directory isn't winding up uh, being searched. Is Python able to open the file? Maybe you do see its path in there. Is it able to open the file without error, or do you see an error code being returned? If you do, you'll want to read the error and maybe check file and directory permissions. It's on the path. But for some reason, Python, Python can't get it open. The other thing that you'll sometimes notice is that the search is ending prematurely because it finds another file somewhere named example dot and one of those extensions that makes it el eligible to be a, model, a module. And if that's happening, then something is shadowing the module. You might need to rename one or the other or remove an old PYC file. But the S trace will tell you the truth about why Python thinks it's importing example, but another file, another set of source code is winding, there, winding up there instead. Notice, as you're reading through the S trace, you'll sometimes see what looks like an import begin. You'll see Python opening a .py file. And then you'll suddenly see one of those memory map maneuvers that we saw the shared loader involved in. And that's because some modules that you load, let's say underscore SSL from the standard library that links to OpenSSL, actually then depends on those as uh, shared libraries. So you'll often see as you import all the stuff your application needs, you'll see normal PY files or SO files being loaded and then immediately triggering a real reawakening of the um, 
uh, dynamic loader in order to get these files memory mapped. If these files have been upgraded out from under Python, if you compiled your Python against one of these and then it went away and got upgraded, this is where you'll see your error. And what's a really, really difficult to diagnose error when Python just dies with a linker error becomes very easy when you S trace and you see the attempt and failure to load this old library that LS will tell you isn't on your system anymore. Here are two peps you can read that will explain how import has been evolving, how the import statement is more careful today than it used to be. Once your application then has imported everything it needs and is up and running, what kind of calls will you then see? All the memory mapping is over. All of these cascades of reading and statting are over. If your application actually gets up and running, what will you see in the trace? In some cases, there'll be a one-to-one -one correspondence because many OS, and in, in particular socket routines, map directly to system calls. Your code in Python says make dir. In the trace, you will see a make dir. You will ask for a new socket. In the S trace, it will ask for a socket. Uh, you will call os.write. Typically not, but if you did, <laughs> you would see a single dot write happen immediately. All of these kinds of calls map immediately onto the equivalent system call and perform them without delay. In other cases, you will see a one-to-many relationship between something you ask Python to do and then what you actually see in the S trace output. A list dir is not an OS level operation. You will see it do so. When I did it, listed a small directory, it opened it, runs get directory entries over and over again, and then closes it once it finally gets zero back, meaning it's read to the end of the directory. Uh, and this is an example how one call in Python might generate several calls in the S trace that you're studying. If you do get adder info, which seems so innocent, I just want to know <laughs> google.com. I want to know its address. You'll see it open resolve.conf and do a bunch of system calls to read it in and study your system and figure out how your system does name res resolution. And then it'll open the get adder info.conf configuration file. Don't worry, we have five minutes. The, um, if you're ever a speaker, don't panic when you hear applause. <laughs> it, it just means you're behind, not that you're dead, you know, not, not that it's all over. Uh, GAI.conf uh, and does a reads its it read it in, and get at our info is then inspired by these two configuration files to open a socket to another process on my laptop to start sending a bunch of information and doing a DNS lookup, it turns out of google.com. So this is a socket dot single call in Python that does dozens or hundreds of things at the operating system level. Note when you're looking up, when you're trying to figure out is the thing I'm calling in section two of the Unix manual that has system calls or the huge section three that's all of the library calls, um, you'll want to run man in the name of the call and very often Exactly the wrong thing will happen because the Unix manual pages prioritize shell scripters because I suppose they know the least. <laughs> and so if you say man make dir, you don't get the system call make dir. Look at this. This tells you you're seeing the wrong thing if you're trying to debug an S trace. This is the shell command make dir. What you want to do if you don't know what section it's in is to tell man to only pay attention to sections two and three. But if you have a guess as to whether something, like if you see make dir in your trace, you know it must be a system call. Look for it in section two. If something kicks off a bunch of system calls, it's probably a C call from section uh, three. And it's compound. It does a lot of things at the operating system level. Uh, uh, so sections two and three are important to understand. If you don't want to, in confusion, sit there reading a shell script, uh, you know, a shell commands documentation and wondering why that looks nothing like the C call that you're reading about 
Finally, we've talked about one-to-one -one and one-to-many relationships between something happening in your Python script and something happening at your system level. You can find sometimes a kind of one-to-nothing. You do something and nothing happens. Uh, for example, if you print hello and put a trailing comma, telling it, wait, wait, I have more, more information to put here, and then you write the, world, the word world, and then say go to sleep, the crickets will chirp. You will wait. You will see no system calls. You will see no output except, uh, as far as I.O. is concerned because the low levels of the C libraries Python is built on top of do something called buffering. It is not an OS feature. The operating system knows nothing about it. It's a behavior of, in older Python versions, the file objects provided by libc in more recent Python versions by a special home written module, so that finally with, with Python 3 it behaves the same on different OS's, called I.O. In either case, it tries to make I.O. more efficient as long as you're not doing raw system calls, it will batch up lots of output and then produce it all at once when you least expect it. So these three print statements, notice the trailing commas that don't end the line until the third one, are batched up together into a single write call in your S trace and at the OS level. Buffering, because it makes only one of these expensive swaps over to system space, uh, are more efficient. But because it waits until it has uh, more output, it can delay output and be confusing. You can output part of a status message and be confused about why the user doesn't see it till the job or task is over. You can manually grab control of that by doing a dot flush, uh, and that forces a write at the operating system level that you'll see with strace. Uh, or you can run Python with buffering turned off, or even go in and replace the sys.standard out file object with a newly built one where you tell it it is only allowed to buffer zero bytes. In other words, it should always make a write correspond to every attempt to write out of that uh, standard output. When, if you do leave it to its own devices, does buffered output flush on its own? It depends. If the output is a terminal, strace will show you that it's pushing out output every time a new line finally arrives so that each line makes it independently in front of the uh, reader. But if the output is a pipe or a file, it lets output accumulate and accumulate and accumulate until it reaches the operating system's default block size, which can mean hundreds of lines might be written out. You're sitting there waiting before you suddenly see hundreds of them appear at once in the file. How does Python tell what the output is? There's a call backed by an I.O. control. It's called system call that lets Python determine whether standard out is a TTY, is it a device with a user watching or not. Um, there's also a very violent way to exit. Normally when you run sys.exit, it doesn't really immediately exit. It runs through all your file descriptors and flushes them all before leaving in case they were in the middle of a line or a block. Uh, but there is an OS exit underscore, because it's dangerous, call in the standard library that just shuts down immediately with no chance for buffered output to uh, be flushed out. Very quick, but you won't see things you were in the middle of printing. Uh, if you start up any threads, um, you'll see a call called clone that duplicates the current thread of control. If you start up a process, uh, which is going to be a whole different executable, uh, you will also see clone, and then you'll be confused. Well, wait a minute. I said to call ls. I don't see anything about ls in the logs. strace, by default, only traces the process you start, not any of its children use dash f to follow the children's history as well. strace will then prepend each line with the process ID so that you can see that process 42 goes on its merry way, but that the child process 43 goes and runs bin ls. Um, OS.system you'll see not only kicks off bin ls, but runs something called wait uh, for in uh, order to wait until that returns. Um, and if you try tracing any of the subprocess operations, you'll see they're even more complicated as they talk back and forth and wait for the child process to exit. 
always, by the way, when you're looking at a trace for a program that's failing, compare it to a working example. There's nothing sadder than someone who sees something confusing in an S trace, assumes that that therefore must be the problem, and spends hours iterating on what's a perfectly normal thing to see in an S trace. Always try to get the thing you're doing to work and see what a working S trace works like so you really know what's unusual or different in the S trace in the problem situation. One or two common debugging tasks, I'll uh, not go over these in detail, I'll just refer you to the slides. Running out of memory and running out of open file descriptors both have characteristic patterns that you'll see in the S trace. There's a number of additional options like the elapsed time of each system call that you also saw in those uh, counting summaries that we saw earlier. You can extend the amount of the, the size of the string excerpts you see. And finally, I should just mention LTrace and send you in the direction of its documentation. It traces library calls and thus slows your program under test up even more. But I love it for SSL. If you S trace SSL, unless you can read encryption, <laughs> you're not going to be able to understand what's going on. But if instead you set up a little ltrace.conf that describes the SSL write command, you'll suddenly not when the system call is being made, but when Python is calling the SSL library internally to the memory uh, arena of the process, you'll get to peek in on that conversation and see the actual unencrypted data that is being produced in case part of your bug is that that's coming out wrong. S trace and uh, truss on the two different operating systems let you look at the system call where you jump over to the system and ask the OS to do something. And LTrace is more expensive. It peeks into the memory of your process and tries to see whenever it hops the boundary between your code, the Python interpreter, and one of the shared libraries that it depends on. That's all I have. Thank you very much. I'm Brandon Rhodes.